Greetings students. Today we're going to talk about tips for periodontal treatment planning and treatment and we will focus on the codes for those treatment plans. The first thing that we're going to consider is our dental hygiene treatment plan. Well it's going to be based on the following. I will continue to say this, you will get tired of hearing me say this, but we always focus on the patient's health history. We have to assess the findings and from that we come up with our diagnosis. We also want to take into account the following, the patient's goals, what is their chief complaint, their values, their lifestyle, and remember we operate based on evidence. So we always want to do evidence-based dentistry. An important question is, why is the diagnosis so important? You have to remember the diagnosis is going to dictate the treatment plan. So in other words, if you know that your patient was diagnosed with periodontitis, the treatment plan is going to have some form of scaling and root planning unless we decide to extract all the teeth. But immediately we know when a patient has periodontitis that we have to offer either non-surgical alone or non-surgical and surgical therapy for the patient. When a patient is diagnosed as having gingivitis, we know that we're going to treat that patient with an adult prophy. So you already know the treatment that is associated with the diagnosis. However, sometimes we may have to modify that based on the prognosis. When we're looking at our periodontal treatment plans, I'm going to go over what a usual treatment plan would be and then we'll make modifications. So first, patient education, oral hygiene instruction. We want to have our patients demonstrate to us how they're flossing, how they're brushing, so that we can make modifications. Remember, we never teach a patient how to brush or floss. We modify their current home care. Okay. Second, the treatment is based on the diagnosis. So we just talked about that. The only, and it's really not an exception, you may have a patient that's in the maintenance phase and they may have new disease or they may be trapped in the maintenance, well, I shouldn't say trapped, they may be in the maintenance phase temporarily while we're trying to get their oral hygiene up to par for them to be able to have surgery if that's indicated. Okay, so that's the only time sometimes the diagnosis might, you might have periodontitis, but you are maintaining the patient right there in a maintenance only because you're trying to get them ready for surgery. Again, we do not maintain disease. We maintain health. Third, a reevaluation. For the most part, a reevaluation, you're going to do that every time you see the patient. That's going to be pretty informal. However, after you do non-surgical therapy, you will see that patient back for a formal reevaluation, in which case you will document all of your findings. Fourth, periodontal maintenance and recall frequency. Next, we have the periodontal treatment planning and treatment plan if a patient has gingivitis only and they have no attachment loss. The treatment is going to be an adult prophylaxis. So the treatment plan would look like the following. One, patient education, oral hygiene instruction. That code is a 1330. Second, adult prophylaxis. That code is an 1110. Third, fluoride. And that's only if their caries risk is high or you're doing it for prevention. You can also offer it for a moderate uh, caries risk. But you always want to know the rationale why you're offering the fluoride. If it's for prevention, again, make sure you're saying that and you know that right up front and your patient is aware of that also. And then finally, what is our recall? Well, the adult prophylaxis would be an 1110 code every six months. Be mindful that we may have to increase this frequency if you had a patient that was on orthodontic therapy or if a patient had poor oral hygiene and could not maintain until the next six months. 
Okay, we have a new code, the 4346, and this is if a patient has moderate to severe gingivitis only with no attachment loss. That moderate to severe gingivitis would be spontaneous bleeding or heavy bleeding with that spills out of the sulcus. It would be enlarged gingiva, and typically the patient would have 6 millimeter probing depths plus, but again, no attachment loss. So our ultimate goal is to get to the adult prophy. However, the treatment plan with codes would look like the following. We'd have a patient education, oral hygiene instruction, so our 1330. The next code to use would be the 4346, which is for scaling in the presence of moderate to severe inflammation with no attachment or bone loss. Third, you do the fluoride again, you have to know your rationale if it's indicated or if it's not. If it's not indicated, remove it from your treatment plan. Next, we do a reevaluation of the gingival response. And that could be done at four weeks because we know that connective tissue heals at roughly about four weeks. And we know that the epithelium heals at roughly about two weeks. Um, so therefore, you could consider doing an adult prophy if your assessment was correct, that means you're going to recheck your probing depths. You're going to recheck everything when that patient returns, because although this code has been introduced, there has not been given a time frame for when you would actually go from the 4346 to the adult prophy. Ideally, that is the code that you would be going to. However, sometimes we're wrong. And when that inflammation is resolved, we may realize that we have attachment loss and that, in fact, we do have to do some scaling and root planing. But again, ideally, in this case, we're going to an adult prophylaxis, and that would be done every six months, or we would incorporate treatment for scaling and root planing again if attachment loss is found after the resolution of the inflammation. Remember again that with that adult prophy, that prophy frequency can be altered based on if a patient is in orthodontic therapy or if they have poor oral hygiene. I am including this slide for steps for prophylaxis, although some of these things you really will not realize until you get to the clinic floor. However, for completion's sake, and so did you know for the most part what a prophylaxis consists of, especially when you were on the clinic floor, I am leaving this slide in. For this next slide, steps for the plaque index, this is important because when you see a patient, you must always, after you get your data checked, you're always going to do your plaque index before you actually debride or complete a prophy or scaling and root planing on a patient. The reason why is because you want to reinforce the behavior and you want to see that they can adequately remove the plaque that is stained on their teeth. Also, you want to assess their flossing technique, okay? So you always have to get feedback before you remove any of the plaque. Other than that, you want to basically keep this slide for your own understanding, but that's pretty much what you need to know right now. Okay, now, if your patient is on a periodontal maintenance, the treatment would resemble the following. You'd have patient education, oral hygiene instruction, again, 1330. You'd have a periodontal maintenance, which is a 4910, the fluoride, if deemed necessary, and then you'd have the periodontal maintenance every three months. We pretty much put people on a 90-day regimen as far as the maintenance because Roughly, the literature shows that it takes about 90 days to develop pathogenic bacteria. Some literature shows that it occurs earlier than that. But for the most part, the three months has been the most frequently used time frame. And it has kept, for the most part, healthy patients uh, periodontally healthy. This slide, again, just lets you know, for the most part, what occurs inside of a maintenance and what you would do on the clinic floor, just so you have an idea of how the different procedures compare. 
So just the reiteration that the treatment for periodontitis always starts with non-surgical therapy. We have to prepare our patients if they must undergo surgical therapy. Now, the codes will vary depending on if it is generalized or localized periodontitis. And then the need for further comprehensive periodontal therapy will actually be assessed when we have the patient back at a reevaluation to determine how they responded to our non-surgical therapy. Okay, so the treatment plan will look like this for a generalized case of periodontitis. You'll have your patient education. Note that the patient education pretty much is in all phases for all types of treatment. Next, you'll have the scaling and root planning, which is the 4341. That code means that you have greater than three teeth in the quadrant that requires the scaling and root planing. And so that would be times four. Again, you would designate that as the upper right, the upper left, lower left, and lower right to show that it's all four quadrants. Then you would do a reevaluation which would be four to eight weeks later. And that code would be a 4343. And again, based on the fact that you did all quadrants for the scaling and root planing, you're going to reevaluate again all quadrants. So that would again be the upper right, the upper left, lower left, and lower right. Then you would do maintenance on the patient if the patient actually achieved health. If they did not achieve health, we want to refer them to the specialist or the periodontist because they need further comprehensive periodontal therapy. Okay. If, in fact, though, there are any contraindications to surgery, like poor oral hygiene, the patient will be placed on a maintenance until the hygiene improves. We have to be careful. Although my slide says they will be maintained on a maintenance, they'll be placed on a maintenance, and we're going to do the best we can to make sure they're as periodontally stable as possible while we're trying to get them to a point where they can undergo surgery. And again, just be mindful that that 4341 is a code for four or more teeth in a quadrant, okay? Now, let's look at the treatment if you had localized periodontitis this time. So, we have a prophy with localized scaling and root planing, and it would look like this. Patient education, oral hygiene instruction, that's a 1330. Then you do your scaling and root planing. Note that now, instead of a 4341, which is four or more teeth in a quadrant, you have a 4342 which is one to three teeth in a quadrant. So even one tooth in a quadrant can give you this 4342 that you may have to use on your upper right. Next, you have an adult prophy with localized scaling and root planing. Now, the 1112 is an internal code to the University of Detroit Mercy. So it's not a code that you would truly find. What is it telling you then? It's telling you that, yes, I need to do scaling and root planing on one to three teeth. However, I have some additional teeth in my quadrant that don't require scaling and root planing. In fact, because they have no attachment loss, I'm going to use this internal code of 1112. Then you do your reevaluation. Remember, four to eight weeks later, that's going to be multiplied by four because you still have at least one to three teeth in each sextant. Okay? And then you do a maintenance if the patient is healthy, and you do that roughly three months later. And you are going to determine if the patient needs surgery. If so, you will refer them to grad perio. Now, let's look at the right side of this slide. And this one says a maintenance with localized scaling and root planing. So, again, the steps are the same for one and two. The code, which is another internal code for University of Detroit Mercy, is different this time. It's a 4912. And what does that mean? That means that I have attachment loss. So, outside of the 4342, I'm also going to do this 4912 code which has no fee so it should never ever be used by itself and neither should the 1112 it accompanies 
the 4342 you just use it one time with 14342 and basically what you're saying is that I am debriding every tooth inside of this patient's mouth however he has he she has some teeth that need scaling and root planing and the rest I am just debriding okay so then you have reevaluation again times four because you still have four quadrants or four sextants that you're treating okay which again would be designated well in the system under axiom it's going to ask you for the tooth I believe the tooth number anytime you use a 4342 okay next after again you've done your maintenance you're going to do your reevaluation again and then you place the patient on a maintenance if they're healthy and you also want to determine if the patient needs surgery if they do you refer them to grab perio or to the periodontist okay now that we've gone over the adult profi as well as the scaling and root planing with the one to three teeth with the four or greater teeth and we've also gone over the maintenance those are what you're going to see the most and we've also gone over when to refer to grab perio so the tips for periodontal treatment planning are during the initial therapy before the reevaluation is complete you actually want to complete removal of all of your local contributing factors especially those ones that can be addressed as far as the systemic factors those should also be addressed so if you need medical consultations you're trying to help the physician to help your mutual patient to get their diabetes or their HbA1c under control so forth occlusal adjustment should be done if indicated prevention of caries we always want to make sure that we're addressing that with our diet analysis and our behavior modification and we would like to extract hopeless teeth because remember if we're not going to extract them based on the information contained in the PowerPoint on local contributing factors then we're going to have to do some type of periodontal therapy to those teeth meaning that we're going to have to debride them if we're doing scaling and root planing we want to make sure that we remove that plaque and or sometimes calculus around those teeth as far as phase two Therapy should not be started until your periodontium is healthy. You don't want to start putting on crowns and things like that and you have an unstable periodontium. It is a really a disservice to the patient and you're doing a disservice to the profession because we're giving something that we're saying that we cannot necessarily stand behind because the patient is not periodontally stable. Remember that the patient may be placed on a compromised maintenance for several reasons. Uh, we refer to grab perio it is indicated but sometimes we are unable to send them to grab perio because one they don't want to have surgery they're unable to afford the treatment or the oral hygiene may be inadequate or instability of health no matter what it is we still indicated in the record that they really need perio surgery but due to this limitation they are unable to and thus we are maintaining them on a maintenance understanding that their prognosis may actually get worse okay finally note there is no difference between a regular maintenance versus a compromised maintenance except that the perio surgery again is recommended to prevent progression of disease in the compromised maintenance additional tips that will actually help you learn would be you're going to treat one side of the mouth first in treating one side of the mouth you actually allow the patient to have a side to chew on comfortably you actually can do oral hygiene instruction multiple times to see how the patient is doing sometimes we have had to hear things three or four times before we actually adopted it and even still once we know better we don't always do better even though that's the saying you know better you do better sometimes sometimes we even get lazy as practitioners or as dental students or as dentists we have to reassess or reevaluate informally at every visit to reinforce factors like the oral hygiene that is one of the major things that actually keeps us in business is that 
People get tired sometimes of brushing and flossing. They do not incorporate it until they're into their daily regimen, and therefore, a lot of times, they may have breakdown. The reevaluation should officially be again done between four to eight weeks after scaling and root planning. And remember, that's based on connective tissue healing, so we're not just pulling that number out of the sky. The tips on the reevaluation are that information is going to be utilized to determine whether the treatment was successful. It's going to help us to plan for any further treatment. It's going to help us to maintain the health of the patient. And when we do our reevaluation, we'll go over this another time, but just to kind of give you an idea, why are we doing that reevaluation after our non-surgical therapy? Because we'll end up coming up with a new diagnosis, a new prognosis, a new treatment plan. We're going to do a full charting unless it's a localized case, because remember, we really want to focus on those disease sites. And then we're going to have the patients have a, a maintenance schedule or we will refer them to a specialist. So what you're going to notice is that everything you're doing at the reevaluation is everything you did at the initial examination. So I've been teaching this long enough to know that we kind of get a couple of things that students start doing. So I want to make sure that I sort of get that out the way right up front. Note some additional tips. A patient that had periodontitis and now presents for a reevaluation cannot be diagnosed with gingivitis on a reduced periodontium. Why? Because we're not going to take a piece of that tissue and look at it under the microscope. If they still have inflammation or they still have bleeding, we're still going to diagnose them with the periodontitis. In reality, if we were in private practice, we don't diagnose the patient every couple of, or four to eight weeks later. We see where they are. We kind of know initially what they're going to need, and we carry our initial diagnosis and treatment plan to completion. However, because it is important for you to be able to look at the tissues, to learn, you're in a learning environment, we will do that reevaluation at four to eight weeks, and we will reassign a new diagnosis, okay? Remember, the patient must go to health before they can be diagnosed with gingivitis. The problem is some patients take four to eight weeks to get to health. Some patients take six months. Some patients take an entire year to get to health. And every time you see them for that maintenance or whatever the treatment is, you're reinforcing good behavior. You're reinforcing how to maintain a, sterile, a stable periodontium. Okay, so again, there's no way to clinically tell if it's periodontitis or if it's gingivitis. So if you haven't taken them to health, we're just going to call it periodontitis. And finally, there is no such thing as bleeding a little bit. If the patient is bleeding, there is disease. If we haven't taken them to health, then it's still periodontitis. If we believe that we're probing too hard, then all we have to do is come back to that site. And when we get back to that site, if it's still bleeding, then we know that it, it is in fact inflammation because a site that bleeds is going to bleed every single time because you have true ulceration of the epithelium inside of the sulcus. This is just a periodontal flow chart and I can give you all a larger copy so you can see, but basically what it's telling you, you have your initial therapy, you're following either the 4341 or the 4342, and then it lets you know that if you have the 4342, you got your additional internal codes that need to accompany that. And then in four to eight weeks, you basically have them back for a reevaluation. And if it's beyond the eight weeks, you don't have the patient back until 12 weeks or 90 days. And then you're going to do a maintenance. And then after you do that maintenance, you'll have the patient back again in four to eight weeks for the reval. Why? Because you missed that reval interval. If you miss it, the patient more than likely is going to have bleeding and so forth. But that's because they're almost due for a maintenance again. So if you haven't had the opportunity to see where if they were maintaining all of those type of things it is just best 
and it is our um, standard operating procedure to have the patient back at 12 weeks if you miss that four to eight week interval. Okay, so then you're trying to figure out what are my next steps? Is it going to be maintenance? If that's maintenance, that's fine. That should be done in three, four, or six months. Okay, or if you have BOP and the probing depths are deeper or equal to six millimeters, you're going to refer that to grad perio. And basically, you decide from there, well, grad perio will decide does the patient need surgery or if they're going to be placed on a compromised maintenance, we've already discussed that. But that's pretty much what our decisions are. They're either on maintenance or we're referring them to grad perio. Okay? And then, if the, again, if the oral hygiene is poor, we may maintain them in the clinic until they improve their oral hygiene and then send them to grad perio for surgery and or assessment. Finally, we're going to utilize this information on a case and make sure that we can apply it and we understand what codes are to be utilized. And that will give us some better understanding than just hearing this PowerPoint. So now we'll actually, well, first we'll review it. We'll make sure we're familiar with the codes and then we'll apply the codes. Thank you for listening.